And good morning, everybody. For those of you who were here for sessions one and two, you remember we had some uh, some music playing. Today we don't because we were having volume challenges with that music player. So for the next five minutes, we'd love to hear how the weather is near you or one thing that you're looking forward to that isn't FET summer school. So are you going to uh, have a, a Zoom chat with your loved ones? Are you going to get to get outside and enjoy the weather? All those good things. So uh, just for the first couple of minutes, how are things in your neighborhood? Got a few people, camper van life. Bird Hill is warm and sunny. On holidays from Friday, excellent Noala. Oh. Gloriously, gloriously here in the sunny Southeast in Wexford. Sunny Athlone. Lovely. Yeah. Excellent. And I recognize that I could just turn on the, the web weather report and actually get this information, but it's lovely to hear everybody checking in. Sunny and Donegal, great to hear. Gorgeous part of the country. It is always good. That and Leitrim. <laughs> Anyone from Leitrim there? Is it nice and sunny in Leitrim? My father's home county. I had the pleasure of coming to Dublin and Galway last year and uh, for two weeks it was sunny every single day and everybody I met said you must have brought the luck with yourself. You did, you definitely did. Two weeks of sunshine. Two weeks of sunshine, I don't know how we did it. It disappeared in Mead. I'm in Mead as well, Grania. it's gonna come back, it's gonna come back. I'm in Cork and it looks like it's about to pour down with rain. Oh no! Yeah, it's suddenly gone. It was beautiful. It's now gone really, really, really dark. Uh, oh, Sad face. Not Glad bad. I got my walk in. Oh, good idea. Good plan. Well, it, it, if, if you're not looking forward to it, at least your garden is, I imagine. That's a good way of looking at it. Just so. And we've got a few people who have just come in. And while we're waiting in the couple of three minutes, we don't have any opening music, but we do have a question. What are you looking forward to that isn't FET summer school? So perhaps you're on holiday. Perhaps I saw camper van life in here. Uh, saw that uh, I'll be able to Skype with my grandchildren that somebody posted earlier. So these are all good things. And we're grateful to have your ideas as we're going. Any Claire, great part of the country. Christmas. That is. Ah, uh, now that person should be barred. No. <laughs> live, oh, no, 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 no. There's no judgment here. Chris says live music in person. I miss real live music. Yep. Oh, yeah. A live gig. Stand up paddle boarding. I know a lot of people doing stand up paddle boarding these days. That's fun. I don't even know what that is. If you have the balance for it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I definitely don't have the balance for it. Take a surfboard and a long paddle and make sure that you don't go into the drink. Hello, everyone. Solomon Hello. here from Limerick City. Hi, Hello, Limerick Thanks City. for joining us again. Very sunny by the Shannon River. Oh gosh, you know you're making me very jealous. Uh, well, I said she's looking forward to making blackcurrant jelly and we're just about ready to go here. I'm also grateful that people are, are coming on to the audio and the video. We're going to be using these tools as we go along in the session as well. So two little bits of uh, technical stuff before we get going. One, if you want to save bandwidth, if you happen to be on a Wi-Fi connection or whatnot, you might want to turn your video off while you're just listening. And please make sure that you mute your microphone if you're not talking, that'll give everybody a better audio experience. At the same time, we do want to hear from you. We are interruptible today. And uh, we've got our colleague Lorraine who's gonna be watching the chat, but uh, it's properly at the hour. And so let's uh, start it off with Christine. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I was supposed to be here last week and um, Dara, our CEO, was phenomenal at filling in along with Tom and Doreen. Thank them all and Trevor as well uh, for doing such a phenomenal job last week. So um, I'm looking forward to, to learning more about how everybody is finding the best summer school and learning more about how we can contribute and help you going forward. Um, so just to let you know, obviously we're all at home at the moment. Um, so please forgive if you hear a little dog barking or a lawnmower going in the next few minutes, um, but we're going to try our best to keep it as clear as possible for you all. Uh, we'd like to thank Solis and E2BI as part of this experience 
And um, just if you are going to be interacting with us, um, we should probably introduce ourselves. So I'm Christine Hines from Ahead. I'm the Events and Outreach Officer. And just a little tip, if anyone is looking at joining Twitter, which I think is a fantastic resource if you are joining along the Best Summer School or interested in ongoing CPD, it's a fantastic place to go. It's a fantastic place to learn and to connect with colleagues but probably don't use the nickname your godmother gave you, which is something that I've now got to live with professionally. Probably wasn't the best idea. Um, I'm going to introduce my wonderful co-host, Dr. Thomas Tobin. Thank you, Christine, and welcome to the session. So we're glad to have you here as a host. And uh, if you've been to our sessions before, my name's Tom Tobin. I wrote a book on universal design for learning. I've worked with our colleagues at AHEAD on putting together uh, a number of documents that help people in FET with accessibility, inclusion, and inclusive practices. And uh, Christine's story about her Twitter handle is don't take the name that your godmother gave you when you were small. My Twitter story is I'm at Thomas J. Tobin. There's a Roman Catholic bishop here in the United States. He is at Thomas J. Tobin number one. And I often get his tweets. And it's not terribly useful. So I don't think he gets mine, though, for some reason. But uh, that's, a, that's something to clear up later on. I'd like to turn it back over to Christine. She's going to introduce another member of our AHEAD family here. Yes. So, Lorraine, uh, maybe if you would like to explain a little bit more about your work in AHEAD, the information and training officer, I'll let Lorraine take away a bit more or give you a bit more of an idea about her work. Yeah, great. And just to say hello to everybody. I have met many of you over the years in my in my guise and my job as a training officer. And I have traveled many, many miles around the country. But of course, now that we are all not necessarily stuck at home, but we are in a sort of like slightly different situation. But we're still, as you can see, delivering training. So just to let you know that um, we are still doing stuff. And if you are interested to email me directly at lorraine.gallagher at ahead.ie and of course just to give a plug for our membership many of you are actually many of your colleges you're members of ahead and if you are members of ahead you get reduced training rates which is great so for anyone who isn't yet a member do look up on our website and i know that christine is doing some work in the background around membership as well so that's well worth checking out in terms of um benefits of being a member of AHEAD and then as well just to mention as well that I'm also the information officer so if you're ringing the AHEAD phone number and um, it's probably going to be me that you're going to be talking to and in my job in 15 years of working with AHEAD and uh, you wouldn't know what I'd get asked so um, you know so anything that you're not sure about you want to know about ring me if I know it, I'll tell you. If I don't know, I'll find out and get back to you. So just to say as well that you can um, contact me either by phone or by email or by Twitter. So there's loads of way to con ways of con to contact ahead um, and, and I'll forward you on if it's something specific around because we also do employment as well in ahead and, and transitioning from college to employment. So, um, you know, put you in contact with the right person in ahead if it is that if it isn't actually me. So that's me in a nutshell. Thank Grand you. and thank you, Lorraine. And uh, as you can tell, uh, Lorraine is the uh, the detail level, uh, experienced, long serving, long knowing. And she's also our tech support for all of these sessions. So if you have uh, half a second in the chat, uh, just put applause into the chat for Lorraine because she's the one who's been making sure that everything is running smoothly for us here. And as a question in the chat, Alex says, is the digital badge going to be available at some point? And the answer yes. is after all of these sessions, watch yes. your email and those digital badges will be coming out. Actually, can I just add that Trevor Boland, who is actually going to be running the digital badge, will be talking in the next session later in the week. So Trevor will be talking about how you can sign up. Ah, wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Lorraine. And uh, now it's time to do a little bit of a recap, whether you were able to join us for session two or not. Uh, in session one, we talked about the first principle of universal design for learning, which was multiple means of engagement, making sure that your students actually get hooked in and they stay, persist with you. 
session two, which was last time, we talked about multiple means of representing information. So you heard from Dave Mulvaney, talked about his use of uh, different ways of getting people engaged with maths. And he had high tech and low tech ways, but the whole idea was he gave people choices. He gave his students options for how they perceived the information. So sometimes it was text, sometimes the options had to do with video, sometimes it was watching Dave do something where he had a camera on his own hand working through mathematical language. He also gave them options about how they understood symbols and expressions. So he had his very low tech kind of stuff with his uh, pieces of paper stuck up on the wall in his classroom that were just little explanations of all the different terms so that students could look up and literally see what they needed to understand in the moment. And he also had other options for them like reading those same terms in the textbook and also giving people options for comprehension. How do they understand and put things together? Dave looked at places where his students often had problems or often needed reteaching. And he said, all right, here are the places where I'm going to start with universal design for learning with that plus one design. And he would create a study guide that was text-based and he would also create a real quick 30 second video. And he showed us some examples of those. I'd also like to uh, flip over and you'll see your screen move around a little bit. Uh, we had a Padlet and this was the uh, post session two item. And I wanna just highlight a few things that people put in here. I'm gonna scroll the screen. It's probably gonna flicker for you a little bit, but on your screen, you see the entries that people did after session two, where you started thinking about how you can apply multiple means of representation in your own FET circumstances. And on your screen, here's a good bunch of text-based responses. So in an exercise and fitness class, I provide handouts with diagrams and pictures. Then I discovered ThingLink. It allows an, an app that allows me to add pictures, videos, written text, and audio to the diagram all at once in a format for both myself and my students. And so what you're seeing is that people are finding tools that help them to provide just one more way to give the information and then students can choose. They can look at the still images or they can watch a quick video or they could do both. The same thing was true with this Padlet. On your screen, you see five different text-based responses, but not all of the responses were text-based. Some people put in images like this know your rights image about creating group posters for self-advocacy. So that's Patricia Gellin uh, putting that one in there. And here's a PDF for an English class uh, that a colleague is working on here. And I'm gonna scroll a little bit more on this Padlet. And somebody, uh, this is Patricia Bork, who has created some videos and they have the text version of the stuff in the videos as well. And she's also talking about using things like Microsoft Translator that we talked about last time for issues such as dyslexia and dyspraxia. And by the way, dyslexia and dyspraxia, those are things where our students would need an accommodation making one change one time for one person. But universal design for learning is about way more than just accommodations like that. It's about helping to reach out to our students where they are, no matter what their barrier is and helping them to lower them. And that's a wonderful way to now start thinking about this session that we're going to be in here today. And Christine's gonna talk a little bit about the scope of what we'll talk about today. Yes, so um, one thing I forgot to mention, I'm just going to quickly mention here also is that we're going to have a little bit more of that interaction. So we, you know, obviously you don't need to have an extra device with you, but if you would like to interact via the Menti option in a, a little in a slide or two, just make sure you have a phone at the ready as well. And um, if you don't want to use the chat function, that is, or come on the microphone as people did earlier. Um, yep, so today's section, we're going to be looking at the third principle, which is the multiple means of action and expression. And that's basically how you can build in how students or any of your learners can find a way to show their learning. So we're going to be looking at the way your learners are struggling with their activities and assessments in their program with an interactive session, which to uh, Tom is going to cover next. And then after that, we're also going to hear from how horticulture and bake sales were an effective strategy for two particular FET instructors who wanted to provide a new way for their learners to show their learning. So a bit from them a little bit later on after some lovely interaction from Tom. So I'll hand it over to yourself, Tom. Thank you very much. And uh, as Christine mentioned, I'm gonna put on the screen, here's a question for everybody. And 
we'll put some time on the clock and you can respond in the chat feature. If you'd like to be anonymous, we have menti.com and the code for this is four digits this time. It's just code 7498. By the way, that Menti, if you're watching the recording of this video, that Menti code is only available during our session. So if you do want to post uh, your responses after the session and you're watching the recording, please make sure to just email our colleagues at Ahead uh, or get in touch with Christine and her colleagues there. So in your particular courses and programs, what are the activities or assignments or assessments where students have a hard time? Where do they routinely get things wrong or incomplete? You end up having to reteach. Now, this could be a lot of different things, but choose one. If you've been teaching or you have an interaction with your FET students and this happens over and over and over again, what's that one place where they're, they're just not in tune with you in step or they end up having to, uh, to have a reteach on that. So we'll give a couple of minutes here. I've got 12 minutes past the hour and let's put two minutes on the clock here. And I see a bunch coming in in the chat and some coming through to Menti while those are going. If you do want to come on the live microphone, have that in mind and use the raise hand feature in a couple of seconds here. You can find that under participants in the Zoom controls. All right, we've passed two minutes here. And uh, if you're thinking, two minutes goes by really quickly. But if you're the teacher waiting, two minutes seems like an eternity. And this is something that I learned the hard way when I first started teaching, that I would say, oh, let me tell you some information. And then I would say, are there any questions? And then I would wait literally three seconds. And then I'd say, oh, nope, then thanks, and we'll get moving. One of the big things that we can do for our students is to give them time, give them silence, give them quiet in which to think and respond. And if, you're, if you are like I was and your sense of 30 seconds that you kind of rush it, um, I actually use my phone timer to make sure that I've got two full minutes or one full minute or however long we have for a conversation. Uh, we have some things in the chat. We've got some things on, in Menti here on the screen, but I'd like to ask, is there anybody who wanted to share what's one thing in your FET circumstances where your students always get something wrong or they have a hard time with it? Did you want to come on the live microphone? I don't see anybody with a hand up, but uh, does anybody want to come on and share? Let's start off with live comments first, audio comments. All right, at the beginning of the session, we had a bunch of people who are coming on and telling us about what they were looking forward to. And if you do wanna come onto the live microphone, just put a hand up or even just unmute yourself and come on. So uh, Lorraine, did you see some themes coming through in the chat? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, um, you know, people find the hard thing about self-directing themselves. 
you know so that thing about going home and doing the stuff things like um if it hasn't been modeled and shown they're not sure how to do it people get really nervous about having to do demonstrations for example mm. um, and then work experience if they don't know about nursing and then they have to go and do it, they're really nervous. How do we do it? These all these kind of things are that like that piece about being not on site seems to be a big thing. Um, you know, things like reflective journals, lots of courses in the FET have reflective journals. People are not sure how to do this. So those sorts of things. Self-evaluation, that was I, I imagine that actually would be really difficult to evaluate yourself. So how do I do that? So people find that really hard as well. So there's some of the key things. It is that thing about not being on site, having to do it yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the other challenges we're seeing here in the Menti, let me scroll through here on your screen is the same question on Menti. And we've got some real specific examples of some of the themes that Lorraine was talking about. So theory exams, they're always concerns for learners. Uh, my students don't read the question fully or they only read half of it or they only understand a little bit of it. I'm going to scroll down. Your screen might flicker a little bit. Um, sizes in documents in a design-related subject area. Uh, math, some learners will leave it blank no matter how much help they've been given with it. Uh, under level six, academic writing, students struggle to put references correctly. Uh, let's see, referencing sources poses a huge problem for a lot of our students. It needs to be covered several times. Even then, many don't attempt it. Referencing, ooh, let's see, references, 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 reflections. Students sometimes don't answer the question and go off topic. So if I'm hearing some big themes in here, and I'm, I'm going to scroll down a little bit more here, personal reflections, reading skills, is that when the assignment is the format, so if we're teaching writing skills or we're teaching reading skills or math skills, when the assignment is the format, the challenge is that many of our students don't have a lot of practice with the things we're telling them to, to do, and they don't have models ahead of time. So it's not like we can say, oh yeah, you, you probably did this last year. Many of our students, there is no last year. They're coming to us as adult learners, or many of our students don't have people at home who did similar things in their educations. So they might be the first ones to come to schooling in their families for a long, long time. And keep that assessment, keep that activity in mind as we start thinking now about multiple means of action and expression. So when we're thinking about it, um, those common themes of it makes them nervous, they don't have models yet, they have, they need a bunch of opportunities to practice before they get it right, and maybe they're, maybe they're in an area where it's not a strength to begin with and they need to start from a particular place where not everybody else is. So I love the themes that we're putting here and keep this in your mind as we start going. I'd also like to do a little bit of myth busting about this particular part of the Universal Design for Learning framework. And uh, we've got some some ideas to, to reshape a little bit here. So st our students actually have a lot more skills coming into our FET programs than one essay or a multiple choice test or written examination can uncover. Especially our students who have language barriers or cultural challenges. Um, they often come to us with lots of skills and not a lot of ways to express them. So when we're thinking about the myth busting, if we allow them some measure of choice, some measure of control, not do anything you want, but give them one or more options for how they express themselves, we give them agency, we give them a better chance to show what they know, and we reduce their anxiety, their nervousness. How many of your students tell you, I'm just not good at this. You can't teach me this because I stink at this. Um, it's that kind of mindset where if we give them even a little bit of choice, a little bit of control, a little bit of agency, that we're going to see better uh, performance from our students. And to show you what that means, we've actually got two guests today and Christine's going to introduce them. And they're going to talk a little bit about how universal design for learning is not the only way to think about inclusion. 
and how universal design for learning doesn't mean that we have to replace all of the other good practices that we do. So I'll turn it over to Christine. Thanks, Tom. So um, as we mentioned earlier, um, we actually have the fantastic pleasure of having two guest speakers today. Um, and the first one I have the fantastic pleasure to introduce is Christine Carroll. So what she was looking at was how has agriculture been used as an effective method to engage a diverse range of learners about literacy? Well, I'll leave you over to Christine Carroll, who works in the Adult Education Centre in Ballymun, to tell you a bit more about the work that they're doing over there, which has had fantastic results. Um, I don't know, actually, Christine, if you want to start sharing your slides now, and then we can get started on your presentation. Thanks, Christine. Are we good to go? Perfect. Okay. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to Tom and to Christine for inviting me along to today's workshop. Um, my name is Christine Carroll, and I'm the manager with Ballymun Adult Read and Write Scheme. So we offer literacy and basic education programmes for adults uh, living and or working in the Ballymun, Whitehall and Santry areas of Dublin. We've been based in Ballymun since 1986 and were funded by the City of Dublin ETB. And last year we had tuition programmes for 421 adult learners. So the adult learners, as, as you can guess from that sort of number uh, with whom we work, are in general urban. They've been a long time out of education and they're of, of mixed ages, abilities and cultures. Some of the cohort would have a low base in literacy, numeracy and technology skills when they first engage with our service. And a couple of years ago, we were delivering a literacy and a numeracy programme to one group. And the two tutors felt that progress was just very slow. The learners were frustrated and demotivated. And they, the two tutors had real concerns that the students would drop out of the course. So the tutors and myself had a, re, a, re, a review of practice and we quickly realised that a more innovative method of delivery was required to re-engage the learners. So we started off by asking the learners, how could we make learning more interesting and more relevant to them? And it quickly became apparent that they would enjoy a more hands-on learning experience. Some of the group had a strong interest in gardening and they were willing to share their skills as well as to learn more um, about the topic. And we were also very fortunate in that one of the two tutors, Mary, uh, Mary Archer, she has a science teaching background and she's also a keen gardener herself. So there we had our team. So the tutors then agreed that using contextual thematic learning approaches would address the need to find the programme, that would both motivate and also meet the very diverse le learning needs for this group. So the, the thematic learning concept, it offers opportunities for the development of skills through building on an adult learner's prior knowledge, experience, interests um, and needs. And it's used very extensively across the adult basic education sector. The approach is very inclusive and it aligns quite closely with the principles of UDL. So in, in teasing out our idea about delivering a horticulture programme for the first time, we, we needed some space. So we are, most of our tuition programmes take place in Ballymun Adult Education Centre, obviously an urban centre, not much uh, area for growing around the centre itself but we did have a courtyard which at that time was disused and we got permission from the centre manager to create a container flower and, and vegetable garden in that area and we were sort of up and running then. Apologies my um, I just need to move to the next screen. Or did you just try click anywhere maybe that might work. Yeah sorry. Thank you. No problem. So Judith has set about planning the course schedule and in, in discussing this, rather than reinvent the wheel, they decided that they were going to link 
the lessons to the learning outcomes for QQI level two horticulture. And this would also allow them to consider very creative resources in order for students to meet the learning outcomes. I want to just say at this point that at the beginning of this program, achieving accreditation was not a priority in any shape or form. The total focus was on motivating the students to re-engage with learning. But however, the level two horticulture, the learning outcomes there, they provided a structure for the course lesson plans and allowed for the embedding of core literacy and numeracy skills into more practical hands-on activities. And this gave the learners choices about how they would take action and express their skills. So you can see there the, the, the mixture that was involved with the learning outcomes. So the two tutors then, Mary and Dee, they set about uh, creating a learning plan where they would integrate literacy, numeracy and technology along with the hands-on activities. So relating to writing plans to develop reading, writing, spelling skills, they asked students to use correct terminology for planting schemes, for um, for planning and for for uh, growth processes, for making lists of material, for noting planting dates, and for noting progress, they use the class iPad to create notices about planting schemes and and maintenance routines. And they and in doing that, then they repeated and reinforced the language and the terminology um, and the literacy for the broader group. The group use became very proficient at using the internet for research and then for maths and numbers they used functions in a very practical and hands-on way so the students were involved in estimating quantities of seeds and composts and, and pots required to get um, results there was multiplication and division uh, involved and then the, the group worked with data to compare the growth of I think is Christine gone there or is she Wait. and it looks like we may have lost Christine's video and audio but uh, as you can see on the screen uh, Christine's garden was something that was part of one particular set of QQI learning outcomes uh, and what they what the tutors did was they looked at the other QQI programs where they where students were struggling and they said, well, if we ask them to take this horticulture program, it can actually help them to demonstrate the skills for the other programs. And so that's something to think about with your QQI reviewers as well, is how can you get the learning outcomes from one program to cascade into the other ones? And that's by putting some choices here. And we hope that we'll get uh, Christine to come back, but uh, Jennifer Lynch is our other guest. Jennifer, would you like to tell us a little bit about how you used Universal Design for Learning in your program as well? Hi guys, um, I'm just trying to- Don't worry at all. It's a pleasure to also introduce Jennifer as our John Kelly Award winner for 2020 as well. We'll have more information later on at the end of the session about that, but um, she presented and uh, was awarded John Kelly Award as part of the, uh, the AHEAD conference earlier on this year. And Jennifer, you didn't hear it, but I saw everybody who had video was doing the quiet golf clap for you there. So there is applause <laughs> there. That's awesome. Thanks very much. Can you see the screen there? Have I set it up right? Not just um, yet, but it might be just uh, yeah. take a minute or two maybe. Okay. And Jennifer, when you hit that share screen button, you have to click the screen itself and then the share button in the lower, lower corner. I got you now. There it goes. Take it away. Okay. Um, sorry guys, just click on this. So first of all, I just want to apologize because I do have builders in the house at the moment. So I'm hoping that they, they won't be too noisy. Um, 
so just bear with me if if you can so basically what i want to talk today about is um the how of learning really and um i'm just going to tell you about uh, how i incorporated um, the how of learning into um, one of the modules so one of the best pieces of advice that i got actually when i was doing the udl um, course was to start small and so basically what i did was i had a look at um, the disability awareness module that i did and it was a level six disability awareness module um, that i did and um, basically the reason why i chose this module is that we had a very diverse range of students and a lot of learner variability within the class itself um, some of the students wanted to pursue a career in the disability sector um, some of the students themselves had disability um, in, within the classroom or some of them had family members um, in, um, with disability. So they were very interested in the disability um, sector themselves. So um, basically what I did was um, at the start of the year, um, the students were introduced to the concepts of UDL. So when I was doing the course myself, I wanted to, um, I suppose, engage the students in what I was learning and see could I mirror into the disability um, awareness module. And it actually worked out really well because um, the vocabulary that we were using in the disability awareness module, um, when you compare it to the framework of UDL, they're, they're really quite similar. So you're talking about equality, you're talking about student autonomy. Um, and the students were really interested in this concept of the UDL, but also the disability awareness. Um, so what I, what I did was a lot of the students, um, as I said, there was a lot of learner variability. Um, some of the students hadn't used technology tools and I didn't want to overwhelm them with too much technology tools, but I did want to introduce them to some of them and use them throughout the year. So what I did was I showed them a variety of um, technology tools. Um, I used Nearpod um, with quizzes. Um, I used Pinglink um, and I used um, Mentimeter as well. So that was kind of the technology tools that I used. Also, another technology tool I used was WordPress. And WordPress is really good for re re reflections. Um, and I saw um, earlier on that a lot of people put up um, they had difficulties getting um, students to do reflections. So WordPress is a really good technology tool for this because it's really visual. Um, I also used um, Lego, believe it or not, to explain learner variability. So anyone that knows about the duck challenge um, will understand what I'm talking about. If you don't look it up, it's a fantastic way of teaching about learner variability and how everybody approaches learning differently. Um, I used storyboards and collaboration boards as well to, I suppose, articulate what the students already knew about disability, but also what they wanted, wanted to know. So they really wanted to know, um, you know, how to understand difficult concepts. Um, and I suppose we wanted to kind of incorporate a lot of different technology tools if we could. So we were lucky enough to engage with the National Learning Network, Rosalind Park College. Um, these guys were culinary students and um, I, we were lucky enough to engage with their um, um, instructor, Paul Byrne, and he agreed to work with us. So these guys actually are really innovative and creative um, the way they teach their students. So Rosalind Park, Park College is a flagship in the National Learning Network. And um, they actually train students with, um, you know, extra needs and disabilities. So we were, I was really lucky to be able to work um, and co-collaborate with these guys. So basically, I really wanted to, um, you know, incorporate the disability awareness module with a module that they were doing. And it was really important to me that the students, both, both sets of students um, kind of reached different learning outcomes. Um, so what we did was we collaborated together um, and basically what we over a couple of weeks um, it was very student led approach really the students kind of um, took control of their learning um, so they decided that they would like to do workshops they'd like to do um, you know different demonstrations so the guys in Rosen Park were doing um, 
they were doing a, um, a skills um, demonstration for for my students. So it worked out really well. So um, this happened over a couple of weeks. Fundamentally, it was about hitting learning outcomes, but it was also about, um, as Thomas was saying, the other part of it was that the students wanted to um, raise money for Pieta House. So we organized a bake sale and we managed to raise 350 euro um, for a bake, bake sale. So the how of learning is um, really intriguing. So how after all this, you know, doing the bake sale, co-collaborating together, how was I going to get my students to then write a 3000 word or 3500 word essay? So I kind of look, went to the um, module descriptor and had a look. We're all familiar with this. This is a module descriptor. Um, and as you can see that the word limit was 3,000 to 3,500 words. Um, I felt very confined by this. So basically the students had to write five um, different learning journals um, of five different activities that they'd um, done with a person or people with disabilities. Um, so. I was kind of focusing on the 3,500 word essays, um, 2,500 words. So basically what I did was I created a template for the students. Um, and then what the students did was they brought the template with them um, as we were going to NLN and Rosalind Park and they filled it in as, a, as they were going along. So I kind of thought that this would be a really good idea. I gave them a blank template and they, you know, wrote in as they were going along their reflections on what they did. But very quickly I realised actually this isn't working. Um, the students aren't actually, they love the whole concept of it, but the written word really was a struggle for them. So I went back to the module descriptor and I noticed um, QQI are actually very good. Um, they're very innovative in their approach, but I probably had ignored it in the past. And if you see that, um, you know, evidence for assessment techniques may take the form of written, oral, graphic, audio or visual. I had never really focused on this before, but when you understand the UDL framework, um, and the more I learned about it, the more I understand, more understood I could actually, you know, incorporate the UDL framework into what I was trying to achieve. So I handed it back to the students basically and I said to them, okay, if you're struggling with writing, which way would you like to be assessed? And I wanted to offer them an alternative assessment method. So I created a poll. So I asked the students how they'd like to be assessed, but I also wanted to give them options and choices. And I think this is something that I've struggled with in the past. So um, basically 73% of the students said they'd prefer an alternative assessment method to writing an essay, surprise, surprise. So I kind of had to get my thinking cap on then. So I kind of thought, what if the students were offered an alternative to writing an assessment? So this is what I came up with. 73% of the students would prefer to write their activity journal using a portfolio and images. So I suppose the visual aspect here was really important for the students is that they could um, use, you know, the pictures that they had taken um, when they were doing their assessments and use them and, you know, place less emphasis on the written word. So this is the assignment brief that I did up. And I know a lot of people are kind of worried with the UDL, how can I incorporate this? Where do I start? But I will say to you, don't let fear hold you back. So when I looked at the framework and I kind of thought, how can I incorporate this? Again, choice was the thing that stood out to me. So basically I offered um, four different choices of how students could submit their assignment. Um, and I actually seemed to work really well. So I offer them a choice of a PowerPoint presentation. So the students could do a 10 minute PowerPoint presentation using images and videos, and they could present that to the class. But there were students there that also had anxiety issues in the class. So I didn't want to, you know, exclude them. So what I also did was I offered them the choice of doing a PowerPoint presentation using the presenter mode or the screen recording option. So they could actually do that in the safety of their own home. They could do the presentation and then they could just email it into me. Um, so there was a couple of, you know, things that they had to do. 
The third option that I offered them was to do a portfolio using WordPress, which they were familiar with. They could use the images and videos, um, and in that portfolio, they had to outline the five different tasks or activities carried out with the persons or the groups. Um, and the final option was um, using the template that I provided, that most of them hated, by the way. Um, they could use that um, template and just you know, hand it in as an assignment as well. So each journal had to be no less than 700 words. So that's the options that I gave to the students. Um, to be honest with you, when the students came back to me, the majority of them um, decided that they were going to submit it using a portfolio. So they started with the images first. They looked at the images and the videos that they had taken, and then they built up the words around it. Um, so I think when they can reflect with each other and they can bounce ideas off each other, it's a little bit easier to reflect. The, the knock-on effect of this was that the students actually, they, they loved it. Um, I had like 100% attendance every week. Um, the students were really engaged and they felt like because I'd given them choice, um, I'd given them authorship over their assessments. So they felt like they had been given the choice of which way they wanted to submit their assignments. So they definitely became more pur purposeful, engaged and motivated just by offering them choice. So I would say to anyone that's thinking about doing the UDL um, online, the course online, it's, you know, to be brave um, with your choices really, play to the student's strengths. Um, and offer them choice of how they can uh, submit their assignments. Um, so that, that's it, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Jennifer. That was fantastic. If you would stop sharing your screen, it's time now. And while you were presenting, we were having a really robust side conversation in the chat and we were trying to figure out, okay, what were you doing? What were the things you had there? And it's wonderful that you didn't give your students 8 million choices. You really only gave them a few, but, and uh, MT O'Connor said also just doing the presentation was more fun for them or more engaging. And I want to focus now on the UDL behind what you heard in Christine and Jennifer share. So thank you both for, for those. Let me get the screen moving here and go into the slideshow. You just heard from Jennifer. There is evidence of the bake sale on the screen. I'm not hungry at all. No, no, I'm not going to go get a snack later on. But what we're talking about is the last principle of universal design for learn learning and that's multiple means of action and expression. How do your students actually take actions? How do they express themselves in all of the interactions that you have with them? And you'll notice that both Christine and Jennifer did something first. They asked their students. They didn't just say, oh, I think this would be great. Let me give it to them. They asked their students. Christine asked, um, you know, what kinds of well, what kinds of things are you struggling with or where do you have problems? She asked your students. Jennifer asked her students, she did that, uh, that duck challenge and having them build a Lego duck and everybody built it slightly differently. But you notice that she gave them a survey. She said, is this working? Does this actually help you? Uh, is this a, a pinch point or a problem point for you? And when her students said yes, she worked with them to try to find some alternatives for them. Now, what we're talking about is, and you see on your screen here, it says multiple means of action and expression. This is the most powerful part of universal design for learning. And it's the one that almost none of us do because we don't think we have permission to do it or we think that the QQI standards prevent us. And so I was really grateful, Jennifer, that, that you pointed out that QQI standards actually do contain some of the flexibility that allows us to be inclusive in the design of our content and our ideas. Now, take a listen to what Jennifer and Christine did for giving people multiple ways to take physical action. Now, in Christine's story, it was the physical action of planning, planting, and maintaining a garden. But if there are options that allow for different physical responses, not maybe so strongly, but in your field, give your students at least one more way for that to happen. So if your students are, are reading a text in a textbook or 
you have them working on something that's practical and applied, give them more than one way to take that physical action, whether that physical action is clicking on something or it's getting their hands dirty or they're uh, doing knife skills in a culinary arts course or they're uh, working with different materials in a uh, beautician or cosmetology class. Also allow a little bit of flexibility in the pace of the learning. Help the students to have a say in when they move to the next stage. Now, of course, everybody has to move ahead with us in our courses. We can't just give them all the time in the world. At the same time, if somebody gets it and they need to move ahead, let them do it. And if somebody needs a few more supports or structure, create ahead of time a way for that conversation to happen. You also heard both Christine and Jennifer talking about low tech, no tech, and high tech solutions. So uh, the folks in the horticulture program used iPads in order to help with numeracy and literacy. But in Jennifer's program, uh, it was post-it notes on a wall all the way up through using a portfolio tool. And you'll notice too that both Christine and Jennifer used tools that they themselves were comfortable with. The worst thing you can do is you can uh, you know go try to find the latest fancy tool and then spend all your time teaching your students how to use it. Use tools and methods that work for you. And be intentional about what you're actually asking students to do. Give them models, give them structures, and that's part of providing options for physical option for excuse me, physical action. And uh, Chris has, says this may seem like a silly question here in the chat, but let's say one of the QQI requ requirements is 1,500 to 2,000 words on a certain topic. How is this measured if the learners deliver their assignment in the form of an audio or video submission? Some form of captions in addition to the content, perhaps? Excellent question. And 1,500 words, as long as it's recorded, I just spoke 1,500 words since Jennifer finished her share. And if we're recording this session, that recording stands for 1,500 words. And as long as an auditor from QQI can come in and listen to the student actually speaking those 1,500 words out, that counts. Now, here's the, and that actually brings up one of the parts of Universal Design for Learning that we have to be careful about. I teach English composition courses. So uh, if you're used to having certain margins and everything is Times New Roman, 12 point font, double spaced, it's gotta be formatted with a cover page, all that kind of stuff, that's what I teach. So could I tell if somebody had proper formatting and a heading and proper margins if they did an audio version of it? No. So if the format is the assignment, if you absolutely have to be able to put together a word processed written thing to uh, show what you know, then don't give your students an option there. So I tell my students, you have to write me a five page essay and it has to be 2,500 words and that's the end goal. Now, back up a step though. When my students are practicing, if my students are creating paragraphs and I want to make sure that they have a thesis statement and that they're using details, evidence, and examples to support it, I give them that plus one option. I say, you can write this out or you can do a quick audio by turning on the audio recorder on your phone and submit that audio or show me where that audio file is. Because I can grade that, I can give feedback on that in the same way. I can use the same criteria from the QQI program and I can say, did they have a clear thesis? Were there details that supported the thesis? Did they use evidence to support the thesis? Boom, boom, boom. And that's my plus one. All the while knowing that the final product is going to have to be a word processed file. And in that case, if somebody does need an accommodation, if somebody does need some extra help on an, uh, on an individual basis, we can give it to them at that point. So, uh, and, and we've got some other questions that I'll, I'll let everybody in the, uh, in the chat feature here. So there's a question from Shara. Does anybody have ideas for QQI level four graphic design typography essays? It's a killer for trainees year by year. A UDL approach would be brilliant. So let's, let's think about that in the chat as well, if you've got some ideas to help Chiara. But think also about what Jennifer and Christine said in terms of giving people actions for how they express themselves and communicate to you. So in class, we think the only way that students can communicate with us in class is through speaking. And if we provide alternatives to pen 
paper and talking, chances are our students are going to stick with us better and they're going to choose the option that helps them out. You heard Jennifer talk about how she had some students for whom giving a presentation was really anxiety producing. And just giving them the option to record that ahead of time or to do it in a different format reduced the level of fear and anxiety. And that meant that they could keep moving with their assignments. Also allow and support students to use technology or other aids when they're expressing themselves. So if you want your students to share with everybody else, give them a way that they can do that out loud, record it ahead of time, or even draw it out, share in different ways. Um, Jennifer had a picture on her screen. It went by, it was a post-it note wall. It was just pieces of paper with sticky on the back and people wrote down their ideas and posted them on the wall and then they did a share out for that way. We're doing that here in this session as well. We have that anonymous mentee if you don't want your name attached to something. So we've got more than one way for people to express themselves here. Yeah. And Lorraine, do you want, did you want to yeah. come in and, and I have a question share? which is a really good question. Sure. From and it says, is there a different marking scheme for each method of assignment delivery, Jennifer? And I think that's a really good question because that's something that people will wonder about in terms of how am I sure that I'm marking correctly if people use different methods? Yeah, um, and to be honest with you, it's something that I struggled, struggled with at the start when I was trying to incorporate UDL. I was kind of thinking, you know, am I going to give myself so much hard work by offering all these different options? But actually, no. Um, you know, the learning outcomes are the same. And basically, you don't have to do a, um, a different marketing scheme for the different options. So as long as the learning outcomes are the same and you're very clear in the brief um, which way the, the students, you know, can offer up their assessment, well, then you only need to have, you know, a rubric, one rubric done. Um, so it is, um, I know a lot of people struggle with that. And another thing that people have said to me as well, and I saw coming up in the chat there earlier on, is about the external examiner as well. We all have this fear of the external examiner. Is if the external examiner comes in, will they pick this up and stop, stop us? And, you know, I did this this year and the external, external examiner had no issue. And I think, um, again, if you... Um, you know, even if you're in a centre who is very kind of forward thinking and UDL is incorporated, I think if the, that conversation is had with the external examiner that we are incorporating UDL into our curriculum, the external examiner should have no issue with that because you are still hitting the, the learning outcomes. Um, you're using technology um, in certain ways to hit those to, um, outcomes, but you're still hitting them. So I hope that answers that question. Yes, and it, and it allows us to point out one part of UDL underneath that as well. And you should not only, we've got some comments in the chat, you wouldn't need a different marking scheme if you keep the criteria loose. I'll actually say something a little different than that. I would say that the marking criteria should be exactly the same regardless of the options that you're giving. So as long as your marking criteria are focused on how did the student meet the learning outcomes, then the method of meeting the outcome can be different. And you would, you would give marks to a student who did an audio file just the same way that you give marks to a student who did the Microsoft Word or Word process file. The only way that would, that would shift is if the assignment is, if there's marks for writing skills then of course you don't give those choices. But everywhere that you can give those plus one choices for how people take action, it gives them more agency. And the reason that this works, here's a little neuroscience for everybody, construct relevance. I put it into the chat. This is a term that if you want to learn more about it, go to your favorite search engine, put in construct relevance. And it means, are we actually assessing people on only the things that we say we're marking them about? And a lot of our assignments, they kind of wander off into other things and we're expecting stuff that we're not saying we're grading them on. And one last piece here, and uh, you heard this in both Jennifer and Christine's presentations, they avoided what we call serial variety. In other words, if the first assignment is to write something in a word process format, and then the second assignment is to create an audio podcast, and the third assignment is to record a video on your phone, you're not doing UDL. You're just making people do different things at different times. 
UDL is about giving people choices about how they demonstrate their skill in the moment for that one skill. And the last piece of it is on your screen here. It's multiple means of supporting executive functioning. So you heard both Christine and Jennifer talk about how her students really didn't have models yet for the things they were asking them to do. And there's some questions in the chat. Hey, was it hard to teach them WordPress, all those other things? If you do introduce something new in terms of process, support their planning, their strategy, their goal development, show them the structure. Keep your rigor high, but lower the barrier for getting involved in the first place. Provide scaffolds for performance. Show them how this leads to that and builds on the third thing. And show students how to give and receive feedback. We heard in the mentee a little bit earlier that the students really don't know how to do self-assessment or peer assessment because they might not have ever done it or not have done it in a while. And you give your rubrics or excuse me, give your learners rubrics, guides, opportunity for peer assessment and self-assessment. That helps them with executive functioning, keeping track of their time, keeping track of their effort. And if you can give them opportunities for practice that aren't marked, that don't have a grade on them, but you still give them feedback, that really helps them to move things along. And we've got some more questions coming into the chat. So uh, let me uh, back up just a second here. And uh, I'll turn it over to Christine, who's going to talk a little bit about our post-session activity. And then we're going to bring uh, Christine Carroll and Jennifer Lynch back for a last Q&A. Thanks so much, Tom. So I know, apologies, I know we're running a little bit over time at the moment, so I'm going to be quite brief. Um, so please discard that Menti code um, because they actually expire every 30 minutes. But we will be sending you out the link directly to your email, which will be sent in the next 10 minutes. Um, and if you don't receive that email in the next half an hour, just let me know and I'll resend it to you. So the post-session question that we want you to look at is, I suppose, applying what you've heard today and reflect on it in relation to your own context. So when in your program, can you give your students choice about how they can take action and express themselves in both big and small ways? So where in your program can you give your learners an opportunity? Maybe just look at one particular area that you could build that in or you could give them that platform and then maybe you could build on it together. So there's been a lot of really great interactions, a lot of great suggestions and questions, I think, in the chat. And hopefully we can bring them into that post-session question, which will be due then 11 a.m. on Thursday before the session. All um, right, wonderful. Denise, and, and, and I was going to say, I was just going to say, Denise has got her hand raised. So Denise, if you'd like to unmute yourself and come on the line. Hi, thanks. I just wanted to ask you, Tom, and it's around this whole issue of students, like I teach level five and level six. So a lot of the time they don't want to do things inside the classroom or outside the classroom unless they're getting graded on it. Mm -hmm. But yet we have to provide them, as you said, with models of practice in order to get them to be able to get the grades that we need them to, to do. So how do we, how do you advise that we approach that? <laughs> Uh, I, I want to turn this over to, to Jennifer and Christine in a second, but one of the ways that I get folks to do the practice opportunities mm -hmm. is I do a uh, check or plus grading. So, for example, if I've got six practice opportunities, if you do five of the six practice opportunities, that earns you 5% worth of the grade or whatever it is, and you just get a check mark, yes, you've done it, and here's my feedback on it. So in other words, you make it required, but you don't make every instance of it a graded opportunity. Yeah. And that I, way- I think my issue with that then is the issue around QQI, because the marking schemes, I think Jennifer might attest to that, that while the methodologies that we can ask students to present the final or you know, the summative assessment mm -hmm. is very open and is fantastic, the actual marking schemes themselves are really specific so sometimes I find maybe it's just the subjects that I'm teaching that a lot of the time I can't do something like just take 5% of the 30 and put it towards you've done this, you know, three out of six times. Check with some of your colleagues on that, though, because the marking schemes in the QQI programs are for the end demonstrations of skills, not for the practice or the things that lead up to them. So Take, take a deeper dive in there and I'd encourage you. I, I wanna also uh, say we've got a couple more comments coming in uh, in the chat and we wanna give some voice to them. So Denise, thank you for the good question and we'll be sure to follow up with you on that as well. 
But uh, Lorraine, were there a couple other ones that we want to, to highlight as ending questions for today? Um, lots of people said they love the idea of pre-recording presentations, actually. Um, so, lots of really good feedback, actually. I think um, there was a, a question yeah. earlier on, was there, Lorraine, about um, where somebody asked a, a question about what was the feedback from the external authenticator, but I think that was actually addressed. Yeah, there's been a few questions already about the QQI, about the making sure people are within the requirements of the QQI and there's a bit of fear, fear around the external examination part. And, so. and maybe, that's a, maybe that's a good note on which to end. I see a lot of people saying yeah. thank you here. And uh, we've got from uh, somebody talking about, uh, JR is talking about incorporating UDL in QQI. Uh, someone who signed in as Lenovo is saying QQI's level one through three have always implemented UDL. Uh, Solomon talking about the evidence for learning objectives can be handwritten or word processed. Any other format shouldn't be a problem as long as the note to the assessor is included along with the tutor's portfolio. So we've got people thinking about how can you demonstrate skill with your students. And that's our takeaway for today is don't be afraid to dive in and dig in. And if the folks who are your QQI observers and assessors have that there's only one way to do it mindset, it's an opportunity for conversation and it's opportunity for practice. So I'm going to turn it back over to Christine uh, and we'll say good day for today and we'll see you folks for session four. Yes, sorry. Thank you so much, Tom. So just please everyone be mindful that we are going to be handing it over to everybody. We see a lot of interacting. People want to talk to each other and we want to provide you with that platform on Thursday. So please be mindful that we will be having breakout sessions on Thursday. So we would, if you don't mind, ask you just to make sure you have a mic and a headphone or just some quiet place where you can basically be able to interact with other people that will be in the session. Um, because we do want people to be able to collaborate together. That is the, the fourth part or piece of the puzzle that we'll be talking to Tom and also um, Anne Healan, the co-author of the guidebook with Tom, will be coming on to talk to you a bit more about how you can come together and create those networks to help build on what you have and experiment and look at ways that you can work together through your different areas of expertise and, uh, and, and implement UDL if that's what you'd like to continue to go on and do. And if you also would like to share a little bit about what you thought about today, please use hashtag, the hashtag that's below on the screen now, which is hashtag Beth Summer School, and please tag ourselves, which is at Ahead Ireland. Um, we'd love to hear about what you thought of today's session. We'll obviously have a feedback survey at the end, but we would like to share a bit more word about UDL, about the work we did today, and about your thoughts as well. We always like to hear from you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Christine. And thanks to Christine Carroll and Jennifer Lynch for being our guests today. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone.